Following the spectacular failure at liftoff that was Mercury Redstone 1, otherwise known as the 4-inch flight, NASA was not about to lose any steam in their first crewed space program. That flight had failed due to an extremely simple and easy to fix issue. The wrong power cable had been installed on the Redstone booster. So NASA quickly got to work, refurbished the Mercury spacecraft, fetched an all-new Redstone booster, quadruple checked the cabling, and prepared for Mercury Redstone 1A, a full repeat of the previous flight's goals. The first true spaceflight of Project Mercury went off without a hitch on December 19, 1960, from Launch Complex 5 at Cape Canaveral, Florida. Mercury Redstone 1A was intended to be a full, uncrewed spaceflight of a finished Mercury spacecraft, testing its instrumentation, posigrade rockets, retro rockets, and recovery system. Lifting off flawlessly, the rocket carried the spacecraft to an altitude of 210 or 130 miles, which traveled a grand total distance of 378 kilometers or 235 miles. The mission was a complete success, and it was time to move on to crewed flights. Or rather, a form of crew. The United States Project Mercury astronauts are among the observers at the firing of a Redstone rocket carrying an unmanned space capsule. MR-1A is an exact replica of what will be America's first man-in-space capsule. After the flawless launching, the carrier rocket heads down the Atlantic firing range until it burns out and separates from the capsule, which travels 135 miles further out into space before returning to Earth. is as flawless as the launching. It's the first wholly successful test in the Project Mercury series. The entire sequence in space took 16 minutes from blast-off. Scientists reported that everything went exactly as planned. The capsule, which carried some of the most complex instruments involved in any United States space shot to date, returned in fine shape. Good news for the astronauts, one of whom will stake his life on its performance sometime in 1961. Sometime in July of 1957, a common chimpanzee was born in French Cameroon. He was quickly captured by animal trappers and sent to the rare bird farm in Miami, Florida. He was named Ham. Two years after he was born, Ham was purchased by the United States Air Force and brought to Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. He became part of a group of 40 chimpanzee flight candidates, and after evaluation was one of 18, then 6. Ham was trained under the direction of neuroscientist Joseph V. Brady to perform simple time tasks in response to electric lights and sounds. At one point, he was taught to push a lever within five seconds of seeing a flashing blue light. Failure to do so would result in an application of a, quote, light electric shock to his feet, while a correct response earned him a banana pellet. Ham was, of course, most likely unaware that he was being trained to be a substitute human on a space flight. Chimpanzees share many qualities with humans that make them ideal candidates, such as a similar placement of the organs within the body, and a similar reaction time to outside stimulus. With a chimp, they would have a better idea about how well a human pilot might react to a sudden emergency during a spaceflight. With Ham, they had their test subject. Of his 18 months of training, three weeks were spent in a Mercury simulator. At this time, Ham was still one of six chimps who could have been chosen, and while the competition was fierce, Ham was deemed, quote, full of energy and good humor, and would quickly become the most liked candidate. On January 31st, 1961, the three-and-a-half-year-old chimpanzee was prepared for his mission. He was inserted into Mercury spacecraft number 5, several hours before the liftoff of Mercury Redstone 2. This spacecraft had six all-new systems, an environmental control system, attitude stabilization control system, Live retro rockets, though I'm not sure exactly what that means, my best guess is that they could be activated manually, a voice communication system, an abort sensing system, and a pneumatic landing bag. In McDonald's surgically clean white room, the MR2 craft nears completion. Electronic systems to control automatic equipment in the craft after separation from the booster must be checked and rechecked. The retrograde rockets will be tested in space. The antenna housing will transmit telemetry. The heat shield must be inspected carefully before attachment to the craft. 
the Mercury craft and its redstone meet at the launch pad. The pre-planned flight path for MR2 defines a ballistic trajectory 254 miles downrange from launch to touchdown. The spacecraft is to reach a maximum altitude of 120 statute miles. The chimp is to undergo about four and a half minutes of weightlessness. The first United States astronaut will take the same ride in the same van out to the same launch pad and up the same elevator to the top of the rocket and into the Mercury spacecraft, just as Ham is doing today. After several delays, Mercury Redstone 2 was ready to lift off. Four, three, two, one, zero, fire, lift off. And Ham is on his way. One minute into the flight, Telemetry data showed that the flight path angle was too high in rising, and soon after, it was predicting a maximum acceleration of 17 Gs, too high for any chimp or human to handle. At 2 minutes 17 seconds, the booster's liquid oxygen depleted, and this change in chamber pressure was sensed by the new closed-loop abort system. The escape tower fired and carried the spacecraft upwards. Because of both the high flight angle and the boost from the escape tower, the spacecraft reached an unintended apogee of 253 kilometers, or 157 miles. In addition, the retro rockets were jettisoned during the abort, so the spacecraft would have to face atmospheric re-entry at the highest possible speeds. Another problem occurred shortly after the abort. The cabin pressure dropped down to about 7 kilopascals, or 1 pound per square inch. The capsule was effectively exposed to the outside environment. Ham, however, was safe in a couch spacesuit that had its own environmental systems, the pressure within it remaining normal, as well as the temperature staying well within the optimum range. At T plus 5 minutes, Ham reached his apogee high above the Earth. He seemed completely unaffected as he continued performing his tasks of pushing buttons and pulling levers, and around him, a surprising amount of dust and debris floated around in the capsule. Ham is weightless in a world of zero gravity and will be for five full minutes. He appears not to be affected at all as he carries out his assigned tasks. The various problems during ascent resulted in re-entry and splashdown occurring out of visual range of the recovery forces at about T plus 16 minutes. By the time the recovery teams arrived, they found the spacecraft on its side, taking on water, and sinking into the ocean. Upon splashdown, the heat shield had bounced against the bottom of the capsule, punching holes into the bulkhead. The craft also had a snorkel valve on it, and capsizing had caused this open valve to let more water spill into the capsule. The helicopters picked up the capsule with about 800 pounds of water within it, and lowered it onto the deck of the USS Donner. But bring it back. Put it on deck. Bring the crew out to open the hatch and remove the couch. And be aware, the spacecraft traveled 40 miles higher and 120 miles farther than scheduled. The engine shut down a fraction of a second sooner than programmed. The abort system worked, but Ham sustained 18 G instead of the normal 11 that was expected. When the hatch was opened, they found Ham safe and sound, and seemingly in good spirits. Once his spacesuit was opened, he was photographed gleefully accepting his reward for this daring mission, an apple and half of an orange. And it is only at this point will I reveal that Ham was only given the name Ham after he had been recovered. Until that point, just in case, he had been known simply as number 65. Mercury Redstone 2 is a flight that can be properly deemed a partial success. On one hand, the Mercury Redstone launch vehicle was deemed to not yet be safe enough for a nominal human spaceflight. On the other hand, despite a number of failures during ascent and splashdown, Ham came home alive and unharmed. More work clearly needed to be done, but there was nothing about this flight that necessitated halting Project Mercury. Instead, they went to work on Mercury Redstone BD, standing for booster development, and while they did, Ham was retired to a national zoo in Washington, D.C. Ham went on to live for another 17 years, despite suffering from chronic heart disease and liver disease that were unrelated to his spaceflight. On January 19th of 1983, Ham the chimpanzee, the first great ape in outer space, passed away. There was a brief discussion about taxidermying and displaying him at the Smithsonian, much like the Soviet space dogs Belka and Strelka. The public didn't care for this idea, and honestly, neither do I, 
So instead, Ham's skeleton is held in the collection of the National Museum of Health and Medicine, and the rest of his remains were buried at the International Space Hall of Fame. I think about Ham sometimes, and wonder how much he understood about the mission he had performed. I sometimes imagine a scenario, and even considered writing a novel about it, in which Ham spent weeks or more trying to explain to the other chimps in the sanctuary that the Earth is a sphere in outer space, and the humans had sent him to go see it. Maybe I'm a little optimistic. Maybe not. NASA was currently of the opinion that the Redstone booster needed further development, and Dr. Werner von Braun added Mercury Redstone BD to the launch schedule in between MR2 and MR3. This was met with heavy protests, especially by astronaut Alan Shepard who was scheduled for MR3. He argued that the problems with the booster had been readily identified and easily fixed, but von Braun was of the opinion that a crude test could only occur following a perfect test flight, and the Redstone's performance on MR1A and MR2 had not met acceptable standards, despite NASA's own documents citing MR1A as a complete success. The cause of the previous rocket's over-accelerations was a servo valve that was poorly regulating the flow of hydrogen peroxide to the steam generator, which overpowered the fuel pumps. Modifications to the thrust regulator and velocity integrator ensured that the engines wouldn't be able to exceed their limited speeds. Additionally, engine cutoff would no longer signal an abort and thereby stop the inadvertent escape tower firing as it did on MR2. The overall rocket was also given further rigidity via stiffeners installed in the ballast section, as well as insulation applied to the instrument compartment. Made into a boilerplate spacecraft with an inert abort tower and no posigrade or retrograde rockets, Mercury BD launched to an apogee of 182 kilometers or 113 miles, and its ascent was, again, a perfect success. As this was its only goal, it was never fitted with a separation system, and both the spacecraft and rocket crashed into the ocean five miles short of the intended splashdown zone. In a somewhat amusing twist, this lack of separation led to a false rumor beginning to spread in the USSR. Nikolai Kamenin, head of the Soviet cosmonaut office, wrote in his journal that, quote, On March 24, they had a big failure. Capsule Mercury failed to separate from the carrier and sank into the ocean. It's possible that this misjudgment may have spurred the Soviets on, as by the end of the year, they would launch the first human being into space. However, only three weeks later, NASA would do the same. We are now at the starting line of the space race. If you enjoy this content, consider hitting the subscribe button. If you really enjoy this content, consider donating on Patreon, becoming a member, buying some of my books on Amazon, or buying some of my merch. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you over the curve, Space Cowboys.